Paris in the fall, the last months of the year and the end of the millennium. The city holds many memories for me, of cafes, of music, of love, and of death. Virgin seems to be very happy, you know, the, who are the publishers. Um, so, you know, they they wanted us to another, do another game, obviously. They, so we moved on to Baroque Sword very quickly after that. Um, yeah, because there was a two only like a two-year gap, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, 94 was Beneath the Steel Sky, and then 96, is that right, was the Broken Sword 1, Shadow of the Templars? That's right, yes. And 96, yes. yeah, so it's... Uh, a lot of work, you know, went in, you know, when you when you started in 93 to in a short period of time, you know, it was just kind of consistent, wasn't it? It was a lot of work, oh, yeah, I suppose. Yeah. Mm. I think, and and um, Broken Sword itself, you know, sort of like started out in one way and then sort of quickly shifted uh, because, you know, sort of because we went, went straight from Steel Sky to Broken Sword, we were thinking, oh yeah, it's another game that we'll do in, you know, 320 by 2, 240 resolution. So that's how we set about thinking about it. And then, it, and then monitors got better quickly and, and you know, computers had more memory and, and CD-ROMs were rapidly becoming the thing. Um, so, you know, sort of the decision was made with the publishers to actually jump up to four eight, uh, 640 by 480 resolution, which was, you know, sort of like four times the screen area in pixel terms. You know, so it was, it was a huge advance. And so we kind of thought about the graphics differently. And so a lot of the stuff that we'd started out doing, we had to kind of dump and then we thought, oh, because we can go to this high resolution, let's think very differently. So we brought in some Don Bluth guys, um, you know, from the, the, the Don Bluth studios in Ireland. And they gave us lots of great advice on constructing, you know, the locations and, and, and stuff like this. And, you know, sort of one of the, one of the artists actually drew all the backgrounds um in pencil and then we, we then we colored them in in photoshop um instead of you know getting them hand painted externally you know so 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 the drawing was done you know by hand on paper and then um scanned and colored on the computer yeah i, I noticed there was a, a huge improvement with the the graphics from beneath the steel sky to it was like night and day i think you know yeah, the yeah. the color as well in, in broken I, I i played that game when i you know i remember playing that game in 96 and i was just blown away by the um the detail you mm. know um yeah huge improvements in you know in just in two in over a two year period um yes and i it yeah. was and so, you know, the fact that, that we released it in in 96, I think, 
yeah you know was was down to an incredible effort by everyone in the team you know sort of they you know sort of there was an awful lot of work went in you know a huge number of of animation frames um i think there was some oh grief what was it something of the order of forty thousand animation frames um you know yeah. and when you consider that a lot of them are reused like you know sort of the walk cycle for for george and nico and, and things like this you know the repetitive stuff um so it's our forty thousand was was quite incredible so you had but you had a lot of characters that needed unique stuff and you know well, even george had unique stuff when you think of such as you know lifting the lid in the of the bin in the alley and the cat flying out you know oh uh, uh, yeah yeah like this uh, i remember doing that and i jumped at the time i was like it scared the life out of me it's you know it's like 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 a like a, a piano sound i think you know makes a noise and then the cat yeah i remember like being really frightened of that <laughs> that part, that part yeah it's yeah, yeah it, it's, it's designed to kind of make the player jump a little if you know if not more but yeah um even george jumps you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that was um and it was i mean th there was just so many other things that went into that i mean the fact that we had these great backgrounds and great animation and, and such but we also had you know sort of the the music was done by barrington feeling who who did a fantastic job and and i don't think amazing anybody job. Had, i don't yeah, think anybody had approached phenomenal. music like that in yeah. a game before and then we had the fantastic um rolf saxon who did who did the voice of george um uh, rolf saxon yeah from Cal i think he's from california is it, he, he did uh is it one one broken sword one two and three i think he voiced it's it's, it's, it's voiced uh george in all the games uh, all the games yeah yeah yeah, very nice guy as well. You know, sort of really, really pleasant guy to to chat to. Yeah, you ought to do a you ought to do an interview with him at some point. Yeah, yeah. I, I I'd love to do that actually. I mean, um, I think I I did see a video in. I think it was in lockdown. He was being interviewed by one of the comedians. I can't remember his name from up north. Uh, and yeah, he was explaining, you know, um, in in depth about about that game and. He remembers. I think it was uh, he was over here for a couple of months, and yeah, um, sounds like a you know a, a great guy, very you know humble guy, good sense of humour. Yes, he is, and it is, it, you know, sort of he's he's just so, you know, he gets into the voice of George so easily as well, and produces you know such a a consistent. Um, you know performance throughout and and you know sort of most most of the stuff that he does you know is, is one take <laughs> you think you know sort of because he just gets into it so well you know um i mean occasionally we have a five minute break while everybody rolls around on the floor laughing <laughs> <laughs> um when there's you know sort of a bit of a fumble over a phrase or something like this but um generally speaking it's uh, it, it's just so good and and that is the beauty of working with professional actors you know they will deliver so well um and and consistently consist consistently um you know it's just it's just you know it just makes the whole process worthwhile yeah so for you then, do um, Steve uh, for Broken Sword One? Um, what what did you do all together then? And was it you know very, you know, was it a, a sort of like fifteen hour day uh, work? You know that that type of thing. Was it very intense? From from what from what you said, it sounds like um, you know you really put you know everything into it. Um, in a no, short space I mean of time. we didn't. We actually um, we worked very very intensely while we were there um but we never did particularly long days until you know there was there was a bit more you know sort of we worked a bit harder and stuff near the end of the project but for the most part we just worked very well very hard you know sort of in a normal late hour working day you know sort of and i think that 
you start getting everybody, you know, waking long hours from the start of a project and they'll burn out. You know, so. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I was going to ask that, you know, did anyone burn out from, you know, um, making Broken Sword 1 because yeah. it was so, yeah. Did you? Uh, we we, did, no, we handled it very well, I think, on the whole. You know, we had a very efficient process. I mean, uh, um, a short period into Broken Sword, you know, sort of I was actually made the producer on the project. Um, so it was my job to try and get everybody working to the same goals and stuff like this, uh, making sure that, you know, meetings happen, you know, design meetings and, you know, sort of uh, ensured that, you know, all the animators knew what was expected for every single location in the game and, and things like this. Um, you know, pull, pull together people. I mean, we had to, we had to actually outsource some of the animation. Uh, to a company, where was it? Oh, Philippines, I think, somewhere, somewhere out there. Um, but that was actually run by a guy we knew in this country. He was managing it for us. But we had to kind of like set up all the start and end frames and things like this. So we had to manage that. And it was there was a lot of involved in all these different aspects, but. But we actually, you know, sort of handled it very well on an organisational front. And so we never had that intense pressure that, that you often hear about, you know, where you get weeks and weeks and weeks of, you know, crunch time. We never, we never had that. We just, we just kind of like worked hard for the hours that we were there. So how long did it take in total then to, you know, to make the game um, from... Yeah, you know, were you already planning on Broken Swords prior to '94, or was it sort of case of? Oh, definitely yes. I mean, yeah. you know, sort of part way through um, Steel Sky, I was doing some initial, um, you know, painting, uh, you know, concept work and stuff like this. But as I say, you know, that was for based on you know, sort of a lower res a lower resolution uh, screen than we ended up with. So so a lot of that stuff I did was was you know pushed to one side really. So but you know mm. the actual design of it was was in planning stages before you know while while we were still working on on um Steel Sky. And I think you need that kind of overlap. Um so that when you finish one project, you know, sort of you have artists and animators who know what they're doing um the programmers had a big had a big task because they had to kind of you know up the system so that you know we could change our approach you know sort of things like the way that um george walked about around a screen um and the fact that we had um perspective scaling you know, we scaled George to match the perspective in, in each location. So we had to come up with formulas for that. And it's the only only time that I've used my, you know, sort of A-level maths. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so I came up with this formula for it this It came scale. in handy in the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the programmers obviously put the whole thing together um, in a brilliant way. But then, you know, sort of, but they had to kind of scale not only George, but the speed at which he walked. So he didn't suddenly look as though he was speeding up when, when he shrunk small, which you often got with, with, um, on other, on other, um, games where they tried to scale 2D sprites. They didn't scale the, the actual walk speed. Um, so if you actually look at George walking round, it looks like he's properly planting his feet on the ground and he's scaling properly and his speed is scaling and everything, you know, sort of between, between the animator, Steve and, um, the programmers, they did a brilliant job. Um, there is some really clever stuff going on with that. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great, great game for me. I, you know, I, I would say it's the best out of them all. Um, the the storyline, you know, all the you know the different countries that George goes to the you know, the Knights Templars, uh, yeah, it's, it's it's you know a great um, 
a great storyline. So uh, for you then, personally, Steve, you know, what would you say was the, the highlight of, of Broken Sword 1 um, for you? Um, I'm not really sure, to be honest, because it was just such... I don't know. I mean, it was it was absolutely brilliant when we, when it was released, and you know, sort of because we, you know, when you compare it to Steel Sky, I mean, it was just such a bigger project in in so many ways with the amount of resources that that we had to put into it, and, and the quality was was you know a big step up and everything. Um, but you know, sort of, it was just. I don't know. It was it was such a pleasure when you know you got that opening um, monologue from George. Ah, uh, yeah, Paris you in know. the Fall, is it that one? Yes, that, Paris that. in the Fall, the, yeah. the last months of the, the last, year and the end of the, the millennium. You know, and it yeah. just and then you it get gives me you get Barrington. That does, I listen to that. Yeah, yeah. And then you get Barrington's music coming in and and the opening scene and 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 such, and it's just. I don't know. It, it it sent a tingle down our backs. I think when 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 it all came together with the voices and the music and and the whole animated sequence and Kathy blows up and then it all goes quiet and George picks himself up and you know sort of it was quite special. I think you know you know merging from that very cinematic initial sequence into into the game um with with you know a similar level of quality in both and i think you know it just it just felt special yeah and even just like the the humor i was, I was one thing I'm, I'm wondering as well was you know because the humor is it's a, it's a very sort of british dry humor so uh <laughs> were you kind of like um wary of that you know sell it to other markets that may not you know understand the humor because it's kind of you know sarcastic as well and um <laughs> did, did you ever well, think of that as well or was it just the, the the style of the humor really came down to to the main writer who was um dave cummins and he just had this i mean he he did all the all the dialogue for um steel sky and and that was so brilliant and then you know sort of i think that i mean there wasn't a, a lot of sarcasm um but a lot of the sarcasm came from george himself who was an american um character and so you know sort of i think we made it work in that way and i don't think that we've ever had any, any issues with with other markets not really getting george um, hmm. And I don't think that was, I don't think we ever saw that as a problem. I know that <laughs> in a sort of, Charles was a bit wary because we make a, a couple of, and maybe sort of, could sort of be seen as anti American jokes, sort of fairly early on. I mean, there's one bit where, um, where George gets stopped by the, by Sergeant Moe. Ah, yeah, uh, I know with what you're going to say. <laughs> yeah, and he says, "Whoa, I'm innocent. I'm an American. I, I am American. Says, can't, yeah. can't you make up your mind?" <laughs> <laughs> and then there's another one where, where George says to Nico, oh, "You speak very good English for a French girl," and she says, "Well, you speak very good English for an American." <laughs> for an American, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, sort of, there was a little bit of you know concern that maybe you know a couple of of American digs close together like that were um a problem but i don't know i didn't personally didn't see him i think that you know sort of george got more than his own own share of, of digs at the other characters yeah and i remember as well i think charles uh did an interview a couple of years ago where he said he was in a in a, in a taxi or a cab in the u.s do you know about that story Oh, I don't know. He, he tells so many stories. Yeah. <laughs> he was saying that, like, he knew that, that Broken Sword had made the big time. Uh, he, I think he got into, like, a into a cab, or, you know, uh, in the US, and, like, the the cab driver was asking him what his job was. He explained that, you know, he was in the video game industry, and he mentioned um, Broken Sword, and I think the cab driver said, ah, so, uh, are you the one who produced that game or made that game with, with the goat? I could never... 
you know, <laughs> figure out how to get past that. And he said, I knew that at that point that, you know, I'd, uh, you know, that it done well, you know, when you had like this, this stranger in New York who, uh, you know, mm. who played the game. And uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but a few people, you know, sort of um, comment um, about about such things in a similar way. I was once wearing uh, my Beneath Steel Sky T-shirt, and I got stopped in the middle of a shop. <laughs> this guy said, "Wow, it's a great T-shirt. Where do you get it from?" So I said, "Oh, I got it because I worked on the game." Oh, wow, that was my favourite game. <laughs> <laughs> And, and this was about the time we 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 just released um, Broken Sword. He says, "Oh, will you will be will you be doing um, Broken Sword for the Amiga?" <laughs> I says, "No, unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> you know, which we couldn't we couldn't do, yeah, convert it really. It just mean I don't know. We just lose so much. Um, yeah, and we were. I think the world was already moving on past the Amiga at that point." which was unfortunate, right. you know, I mean, things change so quickly, don't they? Yeah. But, um, but yeah, you know, and <laughs> I know I once, <clears throat> excuse me, I once met um, a friend of one of my sons uh, at, my, at my son's wedding. And, um, and he was just saying, oh, you're Jason's dad, are you? you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you do? I says, oh, uh, I make games. You know, so, oh, anything that I might have heard of. I said, well, there's, there's Beneath Steel Sky, Broken Sword, In Cold Blood. In Cold Blood, he says. I've, you know, sort of, that's my favourite game ever. Yeah. Um, <laughs> apparently he had no idea, you know, that his friend's dad was, a, was um, so, uh, you know, my sons are not, you know, don't go out of the way to tell people. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, quite, quite, quite sort of humble about them. Don't sort of like yeah, you know, yeah. go off and things you can, like that. Your kids yeah. are never impressed. <laughs> <laughs> but no, nah. um, but yeah, it's always it's always nice when people say kind things about about the things that you've done. Um, you know, it's, it's it just makes it all worthwhile, really. You know, all the hard work and you know. I was and I was a bug, bug fixing. Or... <laughs> yeah, just even just you know, if you go on onto YouTube and you look at, especially like Broken Sword One, the comments, you know, ninety nine point nine nine percent are just um, so positive. You know, like yeah. nostal- you know, it reminds people of their childhood, or you know, um, it's very nostalgic. I mean, I, I I mean, I don't play video games these days, but I, I've been told that you know, like a lot of people want to go back to. Those those days, you know, with the the humor and the intelligence. So, I, yeah, yeah, people hold it yeah. in in high regard. I think that that a lot of what we did then is is kind of still very relevant now. You know, you look at some of the you know narrative games that are about, and you know, there are people like um, Dave, Dave Gilbert of Wadgy Eye Games who's creating lots of great you know story driven adventures. Um, you know, they aren't necessarily a throwback to those times, but, you know, sort of, they're very much, you know, sort of, um, have a lot of that, that quality about them in many respects. Right. Would you say they are still as popular then as back in 96, these, you know, adventure, um, types of games? One of the things that, that, you know, people think that, Oh yeah, adventure games. Um, you know, sort of died, and and it, strictly speaking, it isn't true. The problem was that adventure games became more expensive to make, um, and it, it wasn't that the audience disappeared. It was that the audience didn't grow like the audience grew for you know the likes of Doom or 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 whatever. You know, sort of. Were, you know the action games were getting better and drawing in more people uh but you know sort of like we didn't have huge numbers compared to today you know back in in you know sort of a broken sword time um i mean 
it sold a lot. I mean, it sold over a million. Uh, but that's over a, a kind of fairly long lifetime, you know. Um, but, you know, publishers looked at them and said, well, you know, it costs this amount to make and it's getting more expensive and we're not increasing the the number of fans. You know, the, the number of fans are still there, but they're not increasing. And that, and that was the thing. That, so publishers were going, it's not, it's not, you know, worth investing. And so, you know, mm. LucasArts stopped making them. Uh, we couldn't get publishers to, to, you know, revolution to, to, to back more games, you know, without going to 3D, like, which is why Broken Sword 3 became 3D. Uh, so we had to, you know, sort of revolution that was starting to change. And then um, it went through a, a bit of a bad spell. And, and so it isn't that the audience isn't there. It's the fact that, you know, sort of, it's, it's quite expensive to make a really good uh, adventure. Certainly, you know, the quality of Broken Sword. Um, and in a sense, you know, the cost, uh, the price of games has gone down in, in real terms. I mean, if you look back at 96, when Broken Sword came out, I think, I think like 40 price. quid, wouldn't they? 45, yeah, 45 40 quid. Pounds. Yeah. Whereas you couldn't even begin to ask that amount of money for a, an adventure game these days. I mean, mostly, you know, sort of. That's a, a very brand, good point, actually. Yeah, that's a good point. A brand new game costs about 20 quid if you can yeah. get away with it. You know, quite a, quite a number of them are around like the, the 15 quid mark. You know, if you go on, on Steam or something like this. Um, the one counter to that is that, you know, sort of there are no more production costs in the sense of, you know, sort of like, um, you know, printing boxes and cases and, you know, and, and, and you know, making the discs themselves. So you don't have those costs. Um, but, you know, at the same time, you've still got to test your games. You've still got to, uh, you know, make sure they're the best that you can. You've still got to pay your animators and your, you know, your writers and your, you know, your programmers and so on. You know, you still got to pay all these people because, you know, sort of that's their livelihood. Yeah. Um, so you've got to be very careful how you go about making games. Um, I mean, it's different if you're making, you know, sort of like The Witcher or something like this, where, you know, sort of you're going to sell a bucket load. Uh, you know, with something like, like an adventure game, you know, unless you're making a broken sword, or Monkey Island, you know, you're going to struggle a bit. And then, um, so moving on from In Cold Blood, in 2001, um, you released Broken Sword 1 on the Game Boy Advance. Um, so um, was it the same as, well, I mean, what, what, what was the difference then between the, you know, the Game Boy Advance version and, and the original one released in, uh, in 96? Um, well, the Game Boy Advance um was obviously very small screens um so we had to reduce the 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 size of the screens um you know quite substantially and um, we had to work out how to get the best from the screens you know in spite of that so there's a lot of conversion down to this small resolution uh the animations in particular were problematical because the, there were so many animations um, that we had to um, either cut some of them out or simplify them you know, by cutting out frames and things like this. Um, if you look at George's animation set of him walking around, um, on, the, on the original PC version, um, he had something like 450 frames of animation just for his walk set. But we simplified that down and I think we reduced it to half because we were using direct control. And so we didn't need the, the, the subtleties that you got, you know, a lot of the subtleties that we put in the original animation set were due to the fact that 
um, the the system was walking George around the screen. You know, you'd click on an area or click on an object, and George would walk over there, and and the system would work would work out how best to get him to that point. You know, with with um, uh, scaling and and you know sort of making sure that his feet didn't slide and all this kind of stuff. Uh, whereas when you're working with direct control, you know, sort of all it has to do is is control the the scaling, you know, because because the the player is actually moving him around, you know, the screen. Um, and it's funny actually when we started doing that, you know, testing out this direct control of George, you know, we weren't convinced that it would work. We thought, oh no, you know, it's point and click. You know, we're so used to doing that. You know, so. But, you know, as soon as we got George walking around under direct control, it felt really good. <laughs> and mm -hmm. and we felt as that we were actually more directly connected with George than we had been in, in the previous version. You know? um, and obviously, the PC version is, is so much better in, in so many ways. But in, in the actual respect to controlling, him, you know, walking George around the screen, just felt really good. Um, you know, sort of, and it just worked. We, you know, sort of, obviously we have to change so that, you know, when you watch George and Aaron objects, it would highlight so you could then interact with it. Um, you know, so there were differences like that, but, um, but we were surprised how, how well it actually worked as um, an adventure game. You know, and it was just a real pleasure to work on in that sense. And, you know, sort of because of because the the restrictions on the size of the cartridge for the GBA, you know, the memory restrictions, we had to kind we couldn't just import the coding and, and, and stuff like that. A different engine had to be built. And so we had to actually re implement it. I mean, it wasn't overly difficult. Um because we, we, we knew that the original worked. So we just we just used the original as the model and re-implemented it. So we had to actually do quite a bit of work um, and that, and then obviously making sure the screens worked and the, the, you know, sort of the highlighting bits and pieces worked and so on. Uh, so yeah, it, it was, it was a fun game to work on. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed working on that. And I think as a GBA game, it works really well. Yeah, I'd, ne I'd never actually played the um, the GBA version. Um, so I, I understand as well as it like the the voiceovers were sort of they they didn't exist. Is that right? It was just sort of well, text. I mean, there's there's so much memory involved in in voice samples. Um, there's no way that we could have, have used that. So it was just text only. Um, you know, so and and because the screens were small. Um, you know, sort of the, the characters were, were tiny, really, you know, they, so we actually put up little images of the characters when they were talking, you know, in the corner. I mean, they, were, they didn't take up an awful lot of memory, but, you know, it just allowed us to see these characters better. Um, you know, on the PC, you know, you got a sense of what these characters were like because, you know, they were, they were large enough on screen to do that. But, you know, sort of on the GBA, there were just, you know, little blobs of pixels. <laughs> and and so, you know, we created these little portraits, you know. So that was that was a difference, um, you know, sort of. And and that went quite well. You know, we got all these portraits of, of George and Nico and Lobino and, you know, the Wakeman and Moo and so on. Um, you know, and, and, and so you get you got a sense of who these characters were through these portraits. Um, and, and overall that worked quite well. Yeah, I guess as well, like, um, during that time, I used to play, um, like, you know, the Pokemon, Pokemon games, Pokemon Blue, Pokemon Red, and they, they sold very well. They did very well and they, they didn't have voiceovers either. So I, I guess that, you know, maybe during that time it wasn't, a, you know, a deal breaker then to just no, have the text, no. but people were used to, you know, that anyway on, on, you know, the Game Boy. Um, yeah, 
Yeah. I do. I mean, the voices are fabulous. I mean, you know, um, and, and, and certainly add an awful lot. But as a GBA game, I don't think you missed that. You know, sort of. I mean, people who who had played the original probably would. <laughs> yeah, but, but you know, sort of. Um, so yeah, that was that was a really really fun project to work on, and and um, in spite of having to re-implement the whole thing, you know, we did it in a relatively short time. Um, and did it sort of do well in terms of numbers? Did it sort of, you know, uh, exceed expectations or do better or more or less as you expected? Um, I don't think it set the world away, but but certainly I think it was worth doing. Um, the publisher was happy. Unfortunately, the publisher went out of business before we could get Broken Sword 2 out. We did actually... Uh, as that was the plan to get Broken oh, Sword yeah, 2 on yeah. Game Boy, right? Okay. But we, we did... We actually implemented Broke Sword 2, and it was ne- just never released on the GBA um, because of this, you know, and it, <laughs> it's, it's one of those things, you know, which is unfortunate. But what, what the experience did tell us was that you could create a good um, adventure game using direct control of the character. Which meant that we could reconsider 3D again, you know, because publishers still were interested in 2D adventure games. So, you know, we just came, you know, Revolution came up with the idea of, of Broken Sword 3 as a 3D direct control adventure. Uh, and um, we managed to get publishers interested in that. And so we, we came. <laughs> we 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 continued to do it as it were <laughs> yes so so we brought that out i mean mixed feelings some of the some of the fans were as happy as it you know feeling it should have been in 2d but i don't know i like that game uh, yeah we'll we, we touch on that uh, a bit later with broken soul 3 but just one other question i got with the game by Adva- uh, broken sword 1 yeah. Uh, Game Boy Advance. Um, did you get, um, you know, a lot of people then um, who played maybe Broken Swords for the first time on the GBA? Um, did they then go back and buy the, the PC versions or the PlayStation versions because they were introduced to this game? You know, maybe people who'd missed who'd missed the late nineties. You know, does that make <laughs> sense? Did you get like a lot of, you know, like um... more sales then with the originals because they were, oh, God, let's go back and. Play the original game, and ah, there's a there's a number two as well. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I think there was there was some of that, um, but the GBA market is very different to you know sort of like the 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 PC market. Um, I think you know sort of the. I, I don't think there were probably big numbers. I mean, there will have been some people, you know. I mean, you could get Broken Sword, you know, sort of. I think there was a re- reissue, wasn't there, on a on the sold out label, um, where you could get it, che- you know, more cheaply. Um, so there might there have probably been some uh, who wanted to hear the voices. Uh, one thing that that. That perhaps I should have mentioned when we were talking about Broken Sword One originally was that um, I know that some of the some of the fans of Broken Sword um, actually um, said that they learned English <laughs> by playing the game. Yeah, I've seen a lot of YouTube comments uh, on that. Yeah, they yeah. they say that yeah they they learned like the you know, the English that you wouldn't... Well, as, a, as an English teacher, this is quite interesting because it's like you get to hear the the colloquial English, the English that yeah. you're not going to hear in the... in the te- or see or read in the textbooks or in the academies. It was like, you know, that... Yeah, um, they really got a, a flavour of, of the of the language that's spoken on a, you know, a daily basis. Yeah. And yeah. I've, known, I've known that actually some language teachers, you know, used Broken Sword as a way of teaching a language, 
you know you might teach you, you know you might be teaching german so you you know sort of boot up the german version you know sort of yeah. and, and well i've used it with spanish i've, I've used broken swords um one two and three and five to yeah. improve my spanish yeah yeah it's the same thing yeah it's yes. so detailed, isn't it? So you know, yeah. you've got all the the language. Yeah, if you can, you know, if you can understand a broken sword game, you know, you, you're fluent. I think if you can, yeah. you know, get the get the the gist of what's being said and follow the storylines. Yeah. Well, there's. I mean, we did explore the idea of you know, actually turning it into a language learning tool. You know, sort of, so you could switch between languages. Um you know as part of a, a learning process but that never really got off the ground um, but yeah i think it's really good that that people can you know get benefits from games beyond you know just the fun of of solving the puzzles and and, and such so people have learned english or people have learned you know spanish in your case or helped you with your spanish in yeah you know sort of i think that's brilliant because you know, sort of, it shows that there is more to games than just killing things. <laughs> yeah, especially broken, especially broken sword one in particular. You know, going to yeah. all these. You know, I, I, um, I remember a couple of years ago, I was teaching, um, you know, refugees from from Syria in my local, um, my local area. You know, and mm. I remember, I, I remember saying to them that my first sort of. Um, I, I first heard about Syria through Broken Sword, you know, and yeah. um, things like that, you know, and it opens your imagination. And um, even with, even like with the English game, uh, Broken Sword 1, you know, there's a lot of French spoken as well, you know, like Andre Lobano and, um, mm. you know, so you like, you, you pick up, it's surprising, you know, it sort of makes you more, it makes you want to learn more than just uh, mm. subconsciously, you know, from going to all these locations uh, all, all over the world. Yes. Yes, and certainly you know. So we we love Paris. I mean, I've been to Paris a number of times, and and it was one of Charles's favourite locations. And you know, sort of, we were quite pleased with you know the the feeling that we captured with with the Paris locations. Uh, and of course, you know, sort of like when George goes to Ireland. I mean, you know, sort of like we we have people from Ireland working on the project, so. You know, so we we use their knowledge and experience, and you know the guy who drew the backgrounds was Irish, so you know, sort of, it's just it just helps. And of course, you know, having experienced people creating the backgrounds, they know how to do their research and how to get the right feel and stuff like this. So you know, the the feel of Syria, um, you know, was had a you know sort of. Well, there's slight fant fantasy in because the colouring, but you know, I think there was a, a great feeling there. You know, the marketplace and the, the music was 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 immense. Yeah, the music was amazing. Yeah, I really like. Yeah. yeah, when you go into the club Alamut, I think it's called, <laughs> but and there's, there's a, you know there's the Arabic music, the singing as well. It really gives me goosebumps just thinking about that. It was uh, fantastic, fantastic music. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and also, and I think, also the taxi driver. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. When you talked, to, yeah, Upa, yeah, and then the guy at the bar with, um, I think he lost his. I think, yeah, I just remember one part where uh, didn't yeah. he lose his tongue? And um, right, obviously, yeah. Uta explains to George. He says that um, there was like a competition, and it's something like he did he win did he win or lose the competition? And he says you should have seen the guy who. Who, who was it who lost or who won you know basically saying that you know yeah. if you think this guy's bad you know you've not, <laughs> you don't know what happened to the other you know what yeah. happened to him um yeah. yeah and um with syria as well one thing that i think charles mentioned in an interview a couple of years ago that uh i think he was like approached by a, a syrian journalist and he was just saying like thank you know thank you for putting our our country on the map. Oh, really? I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it was something like that. Yeah, where this journalist was saying that you know through broken swords, you know, it sort of people maybe had not heard of it before, or didn't have an yeah. idea. So he was like saying, you know, thank you, Re Revolution, for you know for for mentioning <laughs> Syria. Yeah, yeah, yeah I to recall that. Yeah, <laughs> I've obviously missed that story. 
<laughs> yeah, I think it's on it's on YouTube somewhere. One of one yeah, of Charles's yeah. interviews. So uh, yeah, yeah, he does a lot of interviews. <laughs> I don't I don't get to see them all. <laughs> <laughs> You speak very good English for a French girl. Thanks. You speak very good English from America. Please, hold it right there. Oh, don't shoot. I'm innocent. I'm an American. What a mess. This bombing is an outrage, is it not? Stop that, monsieur. Stop holding your breath at once. Has it occurred to you that he may be dead, Mou? Oui, monsieur, but I prefer to look on the bright side. Besides, I recall a case where the killer escaped by feigning death. However, in this case, the man is quite dead. It smelled like someone had dumped a truckload of fish in a locker room on a hot summer afternoon. That still does not explain what you are doing down the sewer. For all I know, you are in league with him. Oh no, I'm just a tourist. <laughs> Most tourists are content with the Eiffel Tower, the Louvre, or the Pigalle. I didn't realize my waste pipes were such an attraction. Did you know that one of your customers was a part-time clown? If a guy feels happy with a funny nose and custard down his pants, what's the problem? Thanks for your help, buddy. My pleasure, monsieur. Allow me to shake you by the hand. Huh? Uh, well, okay. What are you trying to do, kill me? You did not find it amusing? I never saw the funny side of electroshock therapy. Eh bien, it is yours to keep. A gift? Do I need a license? No, but I give you a word of warning, monsieur. What? Remember to switch it off before you visit the toilet. See you later. Not if you see me first. Have you seen a clown? I beg your pardon? The clown. A guy in funny pants. Have you seen him? My pants are from England. Marx and Spencer. They are a pleasure and a comfort to wear, with much support. I'm real glad to hear that. You know, it's good to know you Nobel Prize winners are human too. In my country, the people make do with string and egg cartons. For pants? For everything. 
Oppression is the mother of ingenuity. I'm looking for a murderer. Good heavens! You're a private detective. That's correct, ma'am. What's the term you Americans use? It's on the tip of my tongue. I believe what you're thinking of is Dick. Precisely. I'd like to check into room 21. That is not possible. How come? You said it was vacant. It is reserved for another guest. Rats. No, monsieur. Dutch. Do you recognize the man in this photograph? My God, it's him! That's Merlin! She represented everything I loved about the English. The lady was totally deranged. Merlin? You mean King Arthur's wizard? Good heavens, no! Monsieur Merlin is a fellow guest. He's the man I've been telling you about. That's the man who spurned me. Cut the crap and tell me your name. Liam McGuire. What are you doing hanging around the bar, McGuire? I'm on the run from me dad. Why? Did you do something bad? I ain't done nothing, boss. You can tell me, kid. Is it your dad? Oh, sir. He drinks every last penny down his evil throat. And there's me poor old mother, bedridden and dying of presumption. I tried to buy her medicine. Chopped firewood for father Mahoney till me fingers bled. The old skinflint cheated me too. But I took the pennies he gave me back home. Look, ma, says I, see what your darling son has earned with his own sweat and blood. When suddenly, me dad appears and grabs the loot. I'm off to Dublin, heavy drinking, says he. Watch out till I get back. That's why I runned away. Something in the grin on his face told me he wasn't being strictly truthful. Compared to him, Huckleberry Finn was a candidate for Alter Boy of the Year. Top of the morning to you. I beg your pardon. Well, that's what you Irish say, isn't it? Do you want something? Or are you just flaunting your xenophobia? <laughs> Is it a room you're after? That's not a bad idea. Do you have a vacancy? I could, if you don't mind waiting until the last guest checks out. No problem. When will that be? When the undertaker comes to collect him. So you're making snares to trap rabbits. That's right. Do you have a problem with that? Damn right I do. Isn't it painful? Only if I get me fingers caught. I'm talking about the rabbits. Do they feel much pain? You bet. <laughs> if you want to do me a favor, keep a lookout for that guy in the suit. Okay. But it'll cost you a pack of the chips. Did anyone from the village work at Pegram's Dig? I tried it myself, but that high and mighty history man called me incontinent. What a nerve. Hadn't I dug more holes than the rest of them put together? One day archaeologists may be digging up our remains. Imagine that, Mr. O'Brien. I wonder what they'll find. Well, it won't be arrowheads and beakers. Fast food cartons and flavored condoms, more likely. <laughs> How come you got so attached to a polishing machine? I asked you not to call him that. He's got a name, you know. Uh, yeah, Mr. Shiny. It's just that... You think it's odd, don't you? No, I, uh... I don't mind. The rest of the staff think I'm twisted. I heard them snorking behind me back when I gave Mr. Shiny his weekly pull-through. Whatever you've got with this metal mop foot, is probably a fine and noble thing. It is. Say, it's not every day I meet someone as crazy as me. Do you know the nurse on Ward J2? No, monsieur. This is my first day here. I can't wait to get my hands dirty. 
I was talking about treating my first patient, of course. I didn't mean to get my hands dirty with the nurse. Bernie, come here, boy. This is Benoit, my nephew. Can I trust you to look after him? Do your own babysitting, Gramps. Who do you think you are, anyhow? I am Felix Hagenmeyer. And may I say what an honor it is to meet you in person, sir. You are on my medical wall of fame. Right up there with Pasteur and Leary. I look on it as a privilege, no, an honor, to look after your nephew, sir. The nurse told me you keep losing consciousness. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I've had the problem as long as I can remember. It's a real out-of-body experience. <laughs> like death, but not so conclusive. I see. How long does it last? Just a fraction of a second, <laughs> and then I recover. I might not have been a doctor, but I was formulating a diagnosis all the same. This guy was nuts. I know exactly what you mean. It's known in the medical field as blinking. Is it serious? Of course it isn't serious. It's perfectly natural. But just think, two seconds every minute? Why, <laughs> that's almost half an hour every day. Two weeks out of every year spent in total darkness. What about the Hashashin? Uh, uh, he's more likely to have followed Klausner. He'll stop at nothing to prevent the reforging of the soul. And that's bad, is it? As for Klausner, uh, he has gone off to Syria on the island of chains. They have geese in Syria? Hey, Guido! Look at this! Quit fooling around, you moron! Get your ass over here and bring that flashlight! What the? Who's there? Let's get out of here! Visited Nicole's apartment. Yeah, she told me you came by. Ooh, quite a fine Georgie boy. I didn't expect anything quite so sexy. I hope you're referring to the manuscript. Well, we, of course. What do you think of the juggler? Ah, he is excellent, most watchable. But he's blocking the thoroughfare and obstructing traffic. So? He is amusing. The traffic isn't. If he wants to block it, who am I to say no? You're a cop. Ah, oui. So I am. Ah, well. I'd like to have another try at juggling, please. You have gone on a crash course, perhaps? No. I just had an insight into presentation. Huh? Allow me to demonstrate. The balls, please. If you insist on completing your humiliation, monsieur. Okay, now for my secret weapon. The juggler was speechless with rage. You could have mistaken him for a mime. And without a word, he collected his balls... and left in a fury. Who is this Sewer Jacques character, anyway? Ah, if we but knew that, we could have him in custody in an hour. But he is cunning. To despoil the sewers of our fair city, he has co committed many deceptions. He has pretended to be a police officer and deluded a poor war veteran. Uh-oh. He has pretended to be a jongleur. Wow, is that the time? And an American tourist. What nationality are you, monsieur? 
Canadian. Well, uh, gotta go now. See ya. Well, it's not everyone who can say they started an urban myth. This is the chalice I discovered in Spain. I still can't figure out why the Countess gave it to you. After losing it for all those years, she simply gave it away to a total stranger. She's one prawn shot of a paella. The Countess is a fine lady. You shouldn't compare her with seafood. Hey there, young fella. Speak ye you the English? Speak you the Anglaise? Uh, Parlez-vous Anglais? Yes, si, and indeed we, oui. and rather better than you by the sound of it. Does the word Templar mean anything to you? Templar. Templar! Why, yes, of course! It does? Yes! This splendid series of books by Mr. Leslie Chatteris, featuring the roguish Mr. Simon Templar. Great! That's a real help, Nijo. Anything else? The Saint television program, featuring Mr. Roger Moore, of the quizzical eyebrow, and a stick man with a halo. Bing! I saw a medieval picture of a woman. Royalty or nobility, something like that. She was looking in a mirror, but the reflection was of a man with three faces. What do you think of that? I think you should be in therapy. What do you make of that boy in the market, Nejo? Nejo? Ha! Ayo boy, he's too big for sandals. I speak splendid English, and he laughed. He say, Ultar, you big ox, you split infinitive. I say, I split your head if you stay still long enough. <laughs> Pretty funny, yes? Hilarious. You should be on cable. Have you met the taxi man, Ultar? Heavens, yes. What a big man. Very muscular. But you didn't go for a ride. Why, George, you're absolutely the most... Oh, you mean a taxi ride? No, Dwayne wasn't interested, so it didn't happen. Simply memorize this phrase. Il arc le calme. Il arc le calme. Close enough. Now, go over to Arto and deliver those honeyed words even unto his delicate ear. He won't be able to do enough for you. Really? Really. Hello again, sir. Hello. Kebab? Mmm. Yeah? Um, il akul kalb? Filthy! Bad! Bad! I kill you! Whoa! Calm down! I just... Feet... Do your thing. What does il akul kalb mean? Who teach you that? Nejo told me to say it to Arto. And Arto come after you with big knife, yes? Yeah, how did you know? I know Arto. You tell him in bad Arabic that his kebabs made from dog meat. I said he was using dog food? No wonder he went crazy. No. Ultar not mean meat for dog. Ultar mean meat of dog. Oh. Ooh. Hi. Nice club you've got here. I was wondering if you could help me. What? I mean, I beg your pardon? I'm sorry, but I don't understand. No surprise there, all righty. He says sorry, but he not speak English. Uh, but he didn't say anything. He not have tongue. No tongue? What happened? It was bet. Ah, and he lost. He won. You should see other chappy. Oh, yes. It is rather dark in here. I think we should conduct our business outside. Why should I make myself an easier target? If I fire at you, Mr. Stobart, I shall hit you even in here. But, unfortunately, my marksmanship will suffer. It could be the difference between hitting you in the leg or the groin. Oh, man. You're gonna kill me? Your only choice now is whether you die like a man or like a dog.
Okay, you're the boss. I'll take my medicine. You are an honorable man, Mr. Stobart. A rare breed. I should like to shake your hand. Yeah. Well... What the heck? It was a long way down. Below, I could see Ultar's truck. Where's Sergeant Moo? Sergeant Moo? You haven't heard? Heard what? Has something happened to him? Moo is dead. You're kidding. No, monsieur. That's... How? Why? The death of a policeman never comes as a surprise, but always as a shock. But Sergeant Moo? He was so... I know. I know. He was as flexible as a riot baton. Yet his heart was as warm as a freshly extracted urine sample. You've got a phone call. For me? Are you certain? It's a woman. She sounded hot. What woman? She must be mistaken, monsieur. Well, she asked for that hunk of a man with the nicotine fingers and his ass hanging out of his pants. Certainly sounds like me. So, what exactly are you doing here? I'm guarding. You expect to find me sharing sheep? Take it easy. I just didn't realize you were a guard. I'd like to know what you're guarding, please. That's a secret. It wouldn't happen to be an archaeological site, would it? Are you asking me or telling me? I'm telling you. Then why ask? I have a highly responsible job. Ha! Don't pa me, you elephantine oaf. My job is important. Impossible. They would have hired somebody competent in that case. Meaning what? Instead of which they hired a dismal rent -a cop like you. All epaulettes and no brains. Why, you? This looked set to carry on for some time. It was too good an opportunity to miss. The Villa de Vasconcelos was as picturesque as ever. The weather was still clear, and Lopez was still watering the damn lawn. I was beginning to suspect that he was surgically attached to that hose. How come Caesar described Britain as being at the edge of the world? To the Romans, the Mediterranean was the center of the universe. Britain was a remote, unfriendly place, inhabited by blue, painted savages. It hasn't changed much. Well, they've stopped painting themselves blue. Except when they go to a football match. Hi! Having a party? No, this is Britus. Come on, join us, man! We're Basha, wake up, man! What's company? His breath was like the outlet from a chemical factory. Excuse me, mate, he's taking a nap. Sleeping like a bobby. I'll wait him up when we get to Newcastle. We passed through Newcastle half an hour ago. And I never noticed. And tell me this instant, Jean Stobart. I will, when I'm ready. <laughs> no. You took advantage while my hands were tied. Mecklen pointed that gun at me. I thought I was going to die. I thought of all the things I'd never get to do. And kissing you was at the top of my list. It's going to be a pleasure killing the pair of you. Josh, what are we going to do? Come on, Nico. We're leaving. You fools. You cannot escape us. Dido! Stop that. But, Master, the powder. That powder is a form of the English Civil War. You fools. He saw them. Three hundred years old. I thought it was all over, but Nico had one last trick up her sleeve. Or in her handbag, to be exact. A handbag full of plastic explosives. Maybe, but this stuff is brand new. Oh.
You know, you'll never be able to write your story now. I don't care. I've got what I want. Huh? Just tell me one thing, Georges. Is our life together always going to be this crazy?